Book Two of the Shadow and Bone Trilogy by Lee Bardugo, Siege and Storm. Chapter Six. Sankt Ilya stood barefoot on the shore of a dark sea. He wore the ragged remnants of a purple robe, his arms outstretched, his palms turned upward. His face had the blissful, placid expression saints always seem to wear in paintings, usually before they were murdered in some horrific way. Around his neck he wore an iron collar that had once been connected to the heavy fetters around his wrist by thick chains. Now the chains hung broken by his sides. Behind Sankt Ilya, a sinuous white serpent splashed in the waves. A white stag lay at his feet, gazing out at us with dark, steady eyes. But neither of these creatures held our attention. Mountains crowded the background behind the saint's left shoulder, and there, barely visible in the distance, a bird circled a towering stone arch. Mal's finger traced its long tail feathers, rendered in white in the same pale gold that illuminated Sankt Ilya's halo. It can't be real, he said. The stag was real. So was the sea whip. But this is... different. He was right. The firebird didn't belong to one story, but to a thousand. It was at the heart of every Ravkin myth, the inspiration for countless plays and ballads, novels and operas. Ravka's borders were said to have been sketched by the firebird's flight. Its rivers ran with the firebird's tears. Its capital was said to have been founded where a firebird's feather fell to earth. A young warrior had picked up that feather and carried it into battle. No army had been able to stand against him, and he became the first king of Ravka, or so the legend went. The firebird was Ravka. It was not meant to be brought down by a tracker's arrow, its bones worn for the greater glory of some upstart orphan. Sankt Ilya, Mal said. Ilya Morozova. A Grisha saint? I touched the tip of my finger to the page, to the collar, to the two fetters on Morozova's wrists. Three amplifiers, three creatures, and we have two of them. Mal gave his head a firm shake, probably trying to clear away the haze of wine. Abruptly, he shut the book. For a second, I thought he might throw it into the sea, but then he handed it back to me. What are we supposed to do with this, he said. He sounded almost angry. I thought about that all afternoon, all evening, throughout that interminable dinner, my fingers strained to the sea whip scales again and again, as if anxious for the feel of them. Mal, Sturmhond has fabricators in his crew. He thinks I should use the scales, and I think he might be right. Mal's head snapped around. What? I swallowed nervously and plunged ahead. The stag's power isn't enough. Not to fight the darkling, not to destroy the fold. And your answer is a second amplifier? For now. For now? He ran a hand through his hair. Saints, he swore. You want all three. You want to hunt the firebird. I felt suddenly foolish, greedy, even a little ridiculous. The illustration. It's just a picture, Alina, he whispered furiously. It's a drawing by some dead monk. And what if it's more? The Darkling said Morozova's amplifiers were different, that they were meant to be used together. So now you're taking advice from murderers? No, but did you make any other plans with the Darkling while you were holed up together below decks? We weren't holed up together, I said sharply. He was just trying to get under your skin. Well, it worked. He gripped the ship's railing, his knuckles flexing white. Someday I'm going to put an arrow through that bastard's neck. I heard the echo of the Darkling's voice. There are no others like us. I pushed it aside and reached out to lay my hand on Mal's arm. You found the stag, and you found the sea whip. Maybe you were meant to find the firebird, too. He laughed outright, a rueful sound, but I was relieved to hear the bitter edge was gone. I'm a good tracker, Alina, but I'm not that good. We need some place to start. The firebird could be anywhere in the world. You can do it. I know you can. Finally, he sighed and covered my hand with his own. I don't remember anything about Sankt Ilya. That was no surprise. There were hundreds of saints, one for every tiny village and backwater in Ravka. Besides, at Karamzin, religion was considered a peasant preoccupation. We'd gone to church only once or twice a year. My thoughts strayed to the opera. He had given me the Astari Sanctia, but I had no way of knowing what he intended by it, or even if he knew the secret it contained. Me neither, I said, but that arch must mean something. Do you recognize it? When I first glanced at the illustration, the arch had seemed almost familiar but I'd looked at countless books of maps during my training as a cartographer. My memory was a blur of valleys and monuments from Ravka and beyond. I shook my head. No, of course not. That would be too easy. He released a long breath and drew me closer, studying my face in the moonlight. He touched the collar at my neck. Alina, he said, how do we know what these things will do to you? We don't, I admitted. But you want them anyway. The stag, the sea whip, the firebird. I thought of the surge of exultation that had come from using my power in the battle against the Darkling's Horde, the way my body fizzed and thrummed when I wielded the cut. What might it feel like to have that power doubled, trebled? The thought made me dizzy. 
I looked up at the star-filled sky. The night was velvety black and strewn with jewels. The hunger struck me suddenly. I want them, I thought. All that light, all that power. I want it all. A restless shiver moved over me. I ran my thumb down the spine of the Astori Sanctia. Was my greed making me see what I wanted to see? Maybe it was the same greed that had driven the Darkling so many years ago. The greed that had turned him into the black heretic and torn Ravka in two. But I couldn't escape the truth that without the amplifiers, I was no match for him. Mal and I were low on options. We need them, I said. All three. If we ever want to stop running. If we ever want to be free. Mal traced the line of my throat, the curve of my cheek, and all the while he held my gaze. I felt like he was looking for an answer there, but when he finally spoke, he just said, All right. He kissed me once, gently, and though I tried to ignore it, there was something mournful in the brush of his lips. I didn't know if I was eager or simply afraid I'd lose my nerve, but we ignored the late hour and went to Sturmhahn that night. The privateer greeted our request with his usual good cheer, and Mal and I returned to the deck to wait beneath the mizzenmast. A few minutes later, the captain appeared, a material neck and toe. With her hair in braids and yawning like a sleepy child, she didn't look very impressive, but if Sturmhahn said she was his best fabricator, I had to take him at his word. Toya and Tamar trailed behind, carrying lanterns to help the fabricator at her work. If we survived whatever came next, everyone aboard the Volkvoni would know about the second amplifier. I didn't like it, but there was nothing to be done about it. Evening all, said Sturmhahn, slapping his hands together, seemingly oblivious to our somber mood. Perfect night for tearing a hole in the universe, no? I scowled at him and slipped the scales from my pocket. I'd rinsed them in a bucket of seawater, and they gleamed golden in the lamplight. Do you know what to do? I asked the fabricator. She had me turn and show her the back of the collar. I'd only ever glimpsed it in mirrors, but I knew the surface must be near perfect. Certainly my fingers had never been able to detect any seam where David had joined the two pieces of antler together. I handed the scales to Mal, who held that one to the fabricator. Are you sure this is a good idea? she asked. She was gnawing on her lips so aggressively I thought she might draw blood. Of course not, said Sturmhond. Anything worth doing always starts as a bad idea. The fabricator plucked the scale from Mal's fingers and rested it against my wrist, then held out her hand for another. She bent to her work. I felt the heat first, radiating from the scales as their edges began to come apart and then reform. One after another, they melded together, fusing into an overlapping row as the fetter grew around my wrist. The fabricator worked in silence, her hands moving infinitesimal degrees. Tolia and Tamar kept the lamp steady, their faces so still and solemn they might even be icons themselves. Even Sturmhahn had gone quiet. Finally, the two ends of the cuff were nearly touching and only one scale remained. Mal stared down at it, cupped in his palm. Mal, I said. He didn't look at me, but touched one finger to the bare skin of my wrist, the place where my pulse beat, where the fetter would close. Then he handed the last scale to the fabricator. In moments, it was done. Sturmhahn peered at the glittering cuff of scales. Huh, he murmured. I thought the end of the world would be more exciting. Stand back, I said. The group shuffled over to the rail. You too, I told Mal. Reluctantly, he complied. I saw Priviet peering at us from his place by the wheel. Above, the ropes creaked as the men on watch craned their necks to get a better view. I took a deep breath. I had to be careful. No heat, just light. I wiped my damp palms on my coat and spread my arms. Almost before I'd formed the call, the light was rushing toward me. It came from every direction, from a million stars, from a sun still hidden below the horizon. It came with relentless speed and furious intent. Oh, saints, I had time to whisper. Then the light was blazing through me and the night came apart. The sky exploded into brilliant gold. The surface of the water glittered like a massive diamond, reflecting piercing white shards of sunlight. Despite my best intentions, the air shimmered with heat. I closed my eyes against the brightness, trying to focus to regain control. I heard Bagra's harsh voice in my head, demanding that I trust my power. It isn't an animal that shies away from you or chooses whether or not to come when you call it. But this was like nothing I'd felt before. It was an animal. A creature of infinite fire that breathed with the stag's strength and the sea whip's wrath. It coursed through me, stalling my breath, breaking me up, dissolving my edges, until all I knew was light. Too much, I thought in desperation. And at the same time, all I could think was, more. From somewhere far away, I heard voices shouting. I felt the heat billowing around me, lifting my coat, cinching the hair on my arms. I didn't care. Alina! I felt the ship rocking as the sea began to crackle and hiss. Alina! Suddenly, Mal's arms were pulling around me, pulling me back. He held me in a crushing grip, his eyes shut tight against the blaze around us. I smelled sea salt and sweat and, beneath it, his familiar scent. 
Karamzin, meadow grass, the dark green heart of the woods. I remembered my arms, my legs, the press of my ribs as he held me tighter, piecing me back together. I recognized my lips, my teeth, my tongue, my heart, and these new things that were a part of me, collar and fetter. They were bone and breath, muscle and flesh. They were mine. Does the bird feel the weight of its wings? I inhaled, felt since return. I didn't have to take hold of the power. It clung to me as if it were grateful to be home. In a single glorious burst, I released the light. The bright sky fractured, letting the night back in, and all around us sparks fell like fading fireworks, a dream of shining petals blown loose from a thousand flowers. The heat relented. The sea calmed. I drew the last scraps of light together and wove them into a soft sheen that pulsed over the deck of the ship. Sturmhorn and the others were crouched by the railing, their mouths open in what might have been awe or fear. Mal had me crushed to his chest, his face pressed to my hair, his breath coming in harsh gasps. Mal, I said quietly. He clutched me tighter. I squeaked. Mal, I can't breathe. Slowly, he opened his eyes and looked down at me. I dropped my hands and the light disappeared entirely. Only then did he ease his grip. Toy a little lamp and the others got to their feet. Sturmhorn dusted off the gaudy folds of his teal coat. The fabricator looked like she was going to be sick, but it was harder to read the twins' faces. Their golden eyes were alight with something I couldn't name. Well, summoner, said Sturmhorn, a slight wobble to his voice. You certainly know how to put on a show. Mal bracketed my face with his hands. He kissed my brow, my nose, my lips, my hair, then drew me tight against him once again. You're all right, he asked. His voice was rough. Yes, I replied. But that wasn't quite true. I felt the collar at my throat, the pressure of the fetter at my wrists. My other arm felt naked. I was incomplete. Sturmhorn roused his crew, and we were well on our way as dawn broke. We couldn't be sure how far the light I'd created might have stretched, but there was a good chance I'd given away our location. We needed to move fast. Every crewman wanted a look at the second amplifier. Some were wary, others just cautious, but Mal was the one I worried about. He watched me constantly as if he was afraid that at any moment I might lose control. When dusk fell and we went below decks, I cornered him in one of the narrow passageways. I'm fine, I said. Really? How do you know? I just do. I can feel it. You didn't see what I saw. It was... It got away from me. I didn't know what to expect. He shook his head. You were like a stranger, Alina. Beautiful, he said. Terrible. It won't happen again. The fetter is a part of me now, like my lungs or my heart. Your heart, he said flatly. I took his hand in mine and pressed it against my chest. It's still the same heart, Mal. It's still yours. I lifted my other hand and cast a soft tide of sunlight over his face. He flinched. He can never understand your power, and if he does, he will only come to fear you. I pushed the Darkling's voice from my mind. Mal had every right to be afraid. I can do this, I said gently. He shut his eyes and turned his face toward the sunlight that radiated from my hand. Then he tilted his head, resting his cheek against my palm. The light glowed warm against his skin. We stood that way, in silence, until the watch bell rang.